All right, guys, we're going to get started our every two weeks free seminars. We do these Lake Fork Marina. It's just an opportunity for us to meet in person and talk fishing. And you guys can watch on camera when you don't come in person. And tonight we're going to be talking about uh, brim spawn, bluegill spawn, whatever you want to call them, sunfish. Uh, there's like a dozen different names for them. And there's a dozen different kinds swimming around all these lakes. But technically they are brim. But there's, it's the time of year where they start spawning. We're getting up in that mid-70s. If you go back in creeks, you'll find some 80-degree water. And anytime you start seeing that upper 70-degree water, you're going to have brim start to spawn in, in the months of April, May, and June uh, around those water temps. Now, this is a phenomenal opportunity to catch big bass. I mean, it's as easy to do and as consistent as any pattern throughout the year ever will be. It's a On Lake Fork specifically, there's a few different techniques that we'll go into tonight. It is year after year after year. It's like they work. It's like everything. It's like Novocaine, baby. Just give it time. It'll work every time. You know, like it just it doesn't ever fail. So we're going to talk about some of those patterns tonight. Talk about, you know, how to locate brim beds there's a couple ways new technology certainly helps guys it has come time man i've got a new boat that's come in so that means it's time for me to let this one move on to hopefully one of you guys out there watching right now this boat is now officially up for sale let me run you through the details on what we got here we've got a skeeter fxr 20 select what the select means is it's a completely custom ordered boat there is no other skeeter this exact color the seats everything was ordered custom all the graphs, the electronics were ordered custom. Speaking of electronics, as you can see, I got one big 12 inch Lowrance HDS Live right here on the console. I've also got a Lowrance HDS Live on the front that's rigged up with Lowrance Active Target. I've also got a Humminbird 360 unit that's rigged up on the front uh, as well. Now you guys have seen uh, some electronics videos feature over the last year and a half or so. That's been done in this boat with these graphs. They are dialed in, tuned up, ready to go at a very, very high level. About as good as you'll probably be able to find out there. Also have a Lowrance Ghost trolling motor on this boat as well. We've also got what is my opinion the best shallow water anchors power pole blades too those are uh the best shallow water anchors in my opinion I, I the raptors haven't been out long enough for me to make a real fair judgment on them but to my from my experience these things are dependable they hardly ever break when they do break power pole is so great about giving you whatever you need to fix them parts wise or or just replacing them or whatever you need if you happen to break a power pole i'd bet you'd be hard pressed to break a power pole one thing about buying my boat I don't beat it up, I don't abuse it, I keep it in a garage, all that good stuff. I try to take care of it for the next person that gets it. Uh, but the deal is I use this boat more than just about anybody on earth. Like as a fishing guide, we actually sometimes spend more time on the water throughout the year than even the tournament professionals do. So this boat has been put through its paces. It is rigged up the way a full-time fisherman would want it rigged up. If you want to be able to fish at the very highest level, this is about the best value you're going to get on a boat that is equipped to do that. Speaking of the price, we're going to price this thing at $67,000. I know that may seem like a lot for a used boat. This one being a 2021 model, uh, especially, you know, it's two years old as far as the, the we're on 2023 models now. This is 2021. But the thing is, if you've looked at the boat prices lately, you go try to buy a boat that's rigged out like this and custom ordered like this. This boat's over $100,000 now if you go buy a new one like this. So it's $67,000, even though that's a crazy amount of money for a boat, I get it. It's actually a very, very good deal. Uh, and and thank, big thanks to Nautical Mile and Skeeter Boats for giving me the, they, the deal they give me on the boats, which allows me to pass on some savings to you guys when I sell them like now i know some of you guys are going to wonder about the hours before i tell you how many hours it's got on it it's obviously going to have a ton of hours i fish a crazy amount i spend so much time on the water it's going to have a lot of hours two things you need to think about when you hear how many hours it has on here like 80 percent 85 percent i've had it checked on the computer run between 80 and 85 percent of my hours are idle hours from graphing offshore and from idling into areas that have timber on fork because you want to be careful and don't want to damage your boat so a lot of the hours, even though it has a lot, are idle hours, which are very, very low stress on a motor. Number two, these Yamaha shows are made to run thousands of hours. If you break them incorrectly, which I've had a ton of experience doing, and you maintain them correctly, they will literally run for thousands of hours. I have boats that I've used from years ago guiding that I know the people that ended up with them. These boats have 1,500, 2,000 hours on them now and haven't had any major mechanical issues whatsoever over the years. This boat currently sits with 460 hours on it. So it is a lot of hours, but these are smart hours, a lot of idle hours, 
perfectly broken in, perfectly maintained, on time. So this boat should be set up to last you guys for a long, long time. I haven't had any of my boats that people have bought have any major mechanical issues. So that's the deal, man. I love this boat. It's been a phenomenal boat for me and my family. It's been a great boat for my business. Uh, I know it will make somebody a very, very happy boat owner if you want to upgrade and get a top of the line rig that is professionally set up and ready to go. This is your deal, man. Hit us up at yourlakefortguide.com. You can email us, find our email there. You can also text or call 903-519-1542 for any information on purchasing this old bad, bad boy right here. One more feature that's actually one of my favorites that I forgot to mention to you guys. This boat comes equipped with Bluetooth speakers. As you can see right here, we be jamming in this boat, man. I guess we can just kind of start right there on how to locate brim beds in a home 360 is your best friend if you got it. Is it? You got 360? I think you, I know you do. No. no? Live scope. Live scope. Live scope's a little harder to identify brim beds <coughs> unless you go perspective mode. So right. if you go perspective mode on live scope, boy, it gets real easy to identify a brim bed when you got a bunch of little dots swimming around on your live scope out there all bunched up in some craters. You know, everybody knows what a brim bed looks like here, right? Like like what a moon crater looks like, but like a whole bunch of them stacked up next to each other. You know, like an area about the size of your boat usually. Sometimes bigger, sometimes a little smaller, but usually generally around the size of your boat is about how big a brim bed is going to be, like a nice nice size brim bed. Um, and identifying with Humber 360 is just stupid easy because you can go to about 80 or 100 feet if you got good eyes you can go to 100 feet i like to do it on about 80 i'm starting to get old my <laughs> first well i'm telling you listen this is i turned 40 this spring and this last year or so is like this fishing season is the first fishing season where when i'm tying knots i've started squinting i've noticed that's how i noticed it i had no idea that i was starting to lose a little bit of eyesight until one day I'm tying a knot and I realized I used to never squint at these knots when I'm tying them. Now I'm squinting. So it's all downhill from here, right, guys? Right. <laughs> just wait until you try to buy the expensive sunglasses. With oh, them. gosh. Yeah, I can't wait for those days. Oh, bro. Can't wait for those days. It's insane. But yeah, so I like to use, I like to go to 80 feet on my 360. And I can, if there's a decent sized brim bed, I can pick it up pretty quick, right? Like I'm going to see it pretty fast. And, and that's the whole key with the, using the 360 is, getting where you're not outpacing your revolutions on your 360. So sometimes if I'm hunting for brim beds, I'll actually turn that spin rate up. Now you don't get as much detail when you turn that spin rate up, but brim beds don't require a whole lot of detail. Like they, they're pretty obvious on a 360. So I'll turn that spin rate up. That allows me to travel a little bit faster down the bank. You just, you gotta make sure that when that little radar circle thing's turning, right? When it turns right here on this little section, Right, like you can't go past this section before another one hits it right here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like you don't want to outpace where you're getting your swipes at, or you'll you'll miss. You could just be driving by brim beds all day, and if you're unlucky, not see them, you know. So, or or only see part, you know, some of them. So, uh, make sure you don't outpace your 360. But other than that, it's just driving around close to the bank on your 360. Um, the clearer the water is, the deeper they'll spawn. I'll tell you, if you've got a clear water, like Lake Athens has pretty clear water, and on Lake Athens. Man, you can get some brim beds out in 10 or 15 foot of water. So they will, like, they've got that grass out there on Athens, that eelgrass and stuff. Sometimes it's hot drill, sometimes the eelgrass. It'll grow to 8 or 10 foot, and those brim will spawn outside of it. And the only way you'll ever see those is on, like, you're not going to see them with your eyes. You, the only way you know they're there is 360. Uh, so in that situation, the only way you will know it. So, and what that also tells me is, like, there's brim beds on Fork. There's a pond dam right across from here that gets a giant brim bed on it every year. Now, you cannot come anywhere close to seeing that pond dam looking down into the water when you're sitting on top of it. Um, but with 360, I never knew there was brim beds on that all the years I fished here until 360 came out. And then I'm sitting over there fishing the deeper water of the pond dam, like fishing the slope of the pond dam for offshore fish. I look like, that's a brim bed right there. Like, that's no doubt what that is, all them craters like we talked about. So um, 360 will definitely show you a lot more brim beds than you can find with your naked eye. Now, if you don't have 360, the only real reliable way to find a brim bed is looking with your naked eye. And I don't, you know, that makes it tougher for a couple reasons. Number one, you can't see all the brim beds. Number two, you've got to get so close to the brim bed to see it 
that now you've got to back off that area and wait to catch fish around it. You're almost better off picking a corner of a cove or a section of a, of a, of a pocket or whatever and driving down the bank on all of it, looking with your naked eye and going, okay, there's a brim bed, mark it on a tree or something nearby so you remember it, then keep on going and mark as many brim beds as you can in an area. Here's one, here's one, here's one. Now let's go back and fish this one and stay off it. Because the whole key about that is these bass aren't on the brim beds. They're on every piece of cover. They can be on any piece of cover. I should say every. They're on any piece of cover um, that's near those brim beds, and they just kind of hang out. And they're very stationary. These are post spawn fish that are worn out and tired, and they just sit on the stump. They sit on a flooded bush. They sit on a grass line, and they just sit there and wait for one of those brim to be stupid enough to wander off that bed, and they just go shoop, and get him right. So that's they're just ambush predators. Like they're ultimate ambush predators anyway. But they're really in this situation, very very much ambush predators. They ain't chasing nothing down. They're not hunting. They're not. They're not chasing shad down a bank on a shad spawn. This is I'm sitting still, and when it comes to me, I'm going to bite it. And so that is one of the reasons why this pattern is so predictable and so good because they are sitting there with one thing on their mind. Anything in my area is going down, right? So like it's, it's on as soon as something gets over here. So you can catch them on some different type of baits. So really, as far as picking baits and how to fish them, uh, now before we go forward, if you've got 360 and you see that brim bed out at 8 feet, huge advantage. At 80 feet, huge advantage, right? You see the brim bed out at 50, 60, 80 feet away, just power pull down if you can or spot lock and now just throw to everything around that brim bed right away it makes you so and that's what modern electronics do whether it's live scope side scan 360 whatever it is gps mapping the good mapping it makes you so much more efficient so much less dead time on the water right and so that's the advantage of having the 360 for this particular pattern is instead of having a mark and then loop back take my time going back to this one set out off it I'm already sitting out off as soon as I see it because I'm seeing it 80 feet in front of me or 80 feet to the side of me. And now I just power pole down or spot lock and I, I fish the area around that brim bed. As far as how to fish around it, all the decision about you know technique and tactics and bait selection and all that, it boils down to this. We know what they're doing. They're hanging out on the perimeter around the brim bed next to cover. Depending on what that cover is, what bait can I fish in there efficiently? And keep it, you know, give myself many opportunities to get something by that fish's face because that's how they're feeding, right? So in a lot of situations on Lake Fork, standing timber, right? Standing timber. So this year it's a little different. We've got a lot of flooded cover up near the bank, so you're going to find a lot of brim beds near flooded bushes and flooded grasses and things like that from when the lake was low, and now it's flooded. So. This year, some of the bait selection for the brim spawn is going to be a little bit different for me. Traditionally on Lake Fork, and in the right situation this year, especially on a deeper brim bed, I'm going to focus on standing timber, brush piles, lay downs, anything that I can find like that in the area of that brim bed. In those situations, it's as easy as it gets. I mean, it's like pond fishing 101, right? I brought these out of my truck. These are like, I like them so much, and I caught so many fish on them on this brim spawn deal that I bought like, I don't know how many packages of these I bought. All I know is I've got, I've still got a box in my boat that has them in there. And I still had two more packages of this particular color of Zoom Baby Brush Hog in the console of my truck. And that's where I got this one from. And I can see, you can see like all the oils bled into the label and stuff. They've just been sitting in there for three or four years now. Um, but I, this is Watermelon Candy Red. So... That's always been a great color, but just Texas rigging, a little quarter ounce Texas rig, baby brush hog, and you don't have to throw that color. That's my particular color that I've got confidence in around here. Watermelon candy red. It's got green flake, purple flake, and red flake with watermelon base. You know, most of our brim, most of their body is green. A lot of them, their bellies are orange, but they all have some blue, purple, sometimes red, sometimes teal flakes in like little flashes of color in that dark part of their body that's a green pumpkin watermelon seed type color is the majority of their body that's why those green colors work so well like you're never wrong for throwing anything watermelon anything green pumpkin with whatever flake combination you want because there's probably a brim swimming around that lake that has that exact color going on for most of his body um, when it's possible on hard baits or, or other baits if i'm doing this i like to mix in some orange so my main tool for traditional Lake Fork brim fishing, or, or right now deeper brim fishing that I find on 360, is going to be a Zoom Baby Brush Hog Watermelon Candy Red. And I just hit every piece of wood within 
10, 20, maybe 30 at most feet around that brim bed all the way around it, right? It's just pond fishing, baby. Just, this is my pond. Let me pick it apart. And that's why I just call it like pond fishing, right? And what do you do when you go to a small pond? What do you do? You just throw it everything. You pick every piece of it apart, right? So everything around that brim bed is your pond. And just pick it apart with that little Texas rig. Uh, the other technique that traditionally works extremely well, and this is a little bit more hush us top secret guide stuff, whatever you want to call it, uh, is just simply going down a windblown bank in an area where you know there's likely to be some brim or you know there's been some brim beds, go just, it's a way to cover water and accidentally run into them. So again, if you don't have 360, this is a great pattern. Square bill in a bluegill color. Um, you guys have probably heard me talking some about these cornerstone baits. I've been messing around with their square bill a little bit. I've been really impressed with it and they've got a bluegill color that's perfect. So I thought I'd bring it here to show you guys tonight. Um, what does he call this? Hollow gills is the name of the color if you're wanting to look to order them. And cornerstonebaits.com is the website. But, uh, man, this guy, he does, it's funny because, <laughs> hopefully I don't get in trouble for saying this. He reminds me a lot of the early days of Six Sense because the premium hardware that comes on the baits, the hooks, I mean, you, I'll let you guys check this out. The hooks are upgraded. In fact, I think he even states what they are back here somewhere, maybe owner st36 number four trebles owner hyperwire number three like he's using high dollar components on his bait and if you pay attention to this paint job like this guy's paying attention to details that matter before he puts this bait up right so if you look at just this paint job right i want you to look at it real close number one it looks just like a brim does right green back kind of face to the side orange on the belly got the bars like they have and has a little bit of blue mixed in there, a little bit of teal or turquoise type of blue mixed in there I mean, that's the colors of our brim in this area. It's perfect. It's, it's perfect if it was bluegill pattern as you're going to find around here. Now, what's really cool about this bait, if I'm looking at it like this, so if it's a cloudy day, if it's dark conditions, or it's dirtier water, that looks like a solid color, an opaque color, right? But if I get a real sunny day, sometimes those solid colors don't work as good. Sometimes it's more translucent colors work, right? That sucker's translucent. But you'd never know it. And y'all, look, you never know it, but if I shine a light behind it, my phone. I don't know if this will play on camera or not. I shine this light behind it. Hopefully that shows up on camera. Mm -hmm. Can y'all see through it? So you guys are seeing through it? And y'all can pass that bait around and look at it. Careful, them hooks are real sharp. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Like, you, when you find a bait company that's making some, and he's very small. He's only got a few baits on the market right now. And I have been able to, lucky, you know, he's very personable. He talks to, and messages almost everybody that orders, I think. Uh, but he's, you know, I've gotten lucky enough I've talked to him on the phone because I've been really impressed with some of his baits. And so we've messaged back and forth and we talked back and forth. And uh, he's coming out with some new baits. He's working on new baits. He, he's planning on making a full line of hard baits first and then expanding from there. Right now he's only got a few out. But, like, everything that I've seen this guy make, and this is exactly how it was in the beginning with Six Hits, every single thing they make comes out of the package it's it's at least as good if not better than everything else in that category on the market that bait right there also if you'll notice it the body is wide like significantly wider than the bill that makes that bait do some crazy stuff in the water for erratic actions and deflections the other thing about it is the buoyancy that is the most buoyant square bill i've ever seen in my life so when it does stick on something you pop that line if it jiggles loose at all it's coming right off it because it's so buoyant just another great design feature. I mean, and I know I'm sitting here just preaching this bait. Pre God, I'm not under contract with that guy. Like, I'm not getting paid by this dude. I'm just telling y'all the truth. That bait is special. And his topwater bait that I talked about so long was special on that one video. Like, he's making really good stuff. He's got a 20-foot diving crankbait that I got in my boat that I ain't really got to catch anything on yet because I haven't found a lot of fish out there yet. Um, but he's got a 20-foot diving crankbait. It looks like an old 6XD. It's the size profile of a 6XD, and he's getting it to 20 foot. And I'm like, like even when he, so when I got one, I, I, I caught or I messaged him. I was like, bro, are you sure this gets to, there's no way this is getting really, does this really get to 20 foot? He's like, no, yeah. It really, I've thrown it a little, it gets to 20 foot. And it's a little bit, like it's tiny compared to, you know, now if you want to throw a 20 foot diving crankbait, you're throwing a 10XD, maybe an 8XD, but really a 10XD. If you want to get below 20 foot, it's, it's a 10XD, right? They, this, I mean, this crankbait is, the whole bill and everything will fit inside the body of that 10XD. 
You talk about a lot easier on you to drag on your rod, a lot easier throwing it around. I mean, and it's not like throwing a big giant crankbait that big makes that much of a difference on the size bite you get. We all catch big fish on square bills like this. You don't need a huge body crankbait to get big bites. So um, everything I've seen from Cornerstone so far has just been borderline mind-blowing impressive when you really get down to the details. Fishing as much as I do, seeing the different traits and all these different baits I've used over the years, you know, you pay attention to some of that stuff and, and pick up on it. It's been really impressive. So anyway, back to the pattern. The pattern is simple. The pattern is get in an area where bass have been spawning and there's been bluegill on the bank and go down the bank on a windblown bank with that square bill banging it off wood. That's, that's the pattern. And just cover water and like maybe make a few extra casts whenever you get a bite or two. Like slow down a little bit, but don't slow down much. It's really a deal where the more water you cover, and you can embrace your inner KVD, put the troll motor on go, cover a bunch of water, and that is an absolute big fish pattern on fork that goes untalked about. Nobody discusses it. Bluegill spawn, square bill on windy banks, in creek arms, and even sometimes on the main lake, just wherever bass have been spawning, and bluegill have been on the bank, and now bluegill are probably starting to spawn. That deal is, I mean, it's, it's a special pattern that nobody talks about. So... That's the traditional Lake Fork square bill pattern, or uh, bluegill spawn patterns. This year we've got all that flooded cover, right? So right now, if you try to get too shallow with that, like you can still run it in about five foot of water and that square bill will hit bottom in five foot of water. So you can do that, run it in like five to seven foot of water and bang off some trees and stuff and hit the bottom when you're in five. And there's not a lot of that flooded cover that's kind of mucky and stuff in that depth. So you can do that relatively efficiently. But if you go to four foot and less, where you would a lot of times throw a square bill on that pattern, right now a square bill is a bad option because so much of the lake is covered with pencil reeds, some hay grass looking stuff that I don't even know what it is, slime covered bushes that are dying off. Like you just, a square bill is going to muck up and all that. So what do we got to do? We got to pick a bait that we can fish efficiently and effectively in that cover because those fish are in that cover the bass have been spawning in it now the bluegill are going to spawn in it so you got to pick something and the four wheel drive of bass fishing swim jig this is not my favorite swim jig on the market but it is one they have for sale here it is a good one it's got a good hook it's a fine swim jig it's a santone swim jig it's made down the road in east texas uh, but there's a lot of good swim jigs on the market you know what i mean like i do like the six cent swim jig their swim jig is arguably arguably the best one on the market right now. It really is. It's got a flat bottom. It's got a screw lock. Flat bottom balances it out, makes it run true. The screw lock holds the trailer on there longer. Like it's got some advantages to it. The six cent swim jig is very good. Uh, but that is a bait that you can take and just throw it out there, point at it, and reel, and it comes back to you through whatever you throw it in, pretty much for the most part. I mean, it don't really get hung up on much of anything. And, and I like to actually. A lot of people like to throw a swim jig with a crawl bait behind it. I don't. I, I mean, I will. Every once in a while. For the most part, though, I'm putting a swim bait on a swim jig. I don't find that it affects the numbers negatively. I catch the same amount of fish, and I definitely, definitely, definitely seem to catch bigger fish on a swim jig when I use a swim bait for a trailer versus a crawl bait that's flapping. So just my preference on that. I just reached down there and grabbed something else that they sell down there. This is a power swimmer. It looks like a Kitek. You could use a Kitek. You could use a 6 inch divine swim bait. You could use... Probably the best one to put on might be a skinny dipper by Reaction Innovations. But the main thing is a green back and an orange belly. Because what do those bluegill have? A green back and an orange belly. You guys can pass it around and see the color I picked on that. I love the color on that. That's not my favorite swim bait. But honestly, for a swim jig, buy you some cheap baits. Like, as long as that tail will kick behind a swim jig, you're fine. It's not like you're fishing it super slow. You're winding it up through the top of cover. So you're, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to be a fancy swim bait to get a real slow kick or anything like that. Uh, just get one that'll hold up, have some durability, and it will wiggle behind your swim jig. And the other recommendation that I would say for that situation with that cover like that, I think in some of these areas you can get away with throwing a chatterbait, right? Right, like you can get away with throwing a chatterbait. Now I think a chatterbait in the same colors, right, get you some green pump. Oh, by the way, the color on the jig, swim jig, this one's called Sloppy Joe, it's a Santone color. But if you look at it, it's got green pumpkin, a lighter green, purple, and there's like some brownish oranges color. But that's the main thing, is have green and brown or green and orange, and then mix in some blue or purple or something like that. 
Just try to match that bluegill color is all we're doing. And it don't matter, guys. Dirty water, clean water, those bluegill colors work around brim beds because guess what? Those brim don't change colors. Like they're the same color whether the water's... I mean, they may fade or darken up a little bit one way or the other, but for the most part, those brim are green and orange or green and brown no matter what color the water is. And those fish are still eating them. If they're still eating them, they can still eat your jig, right? So uh, don't overthink that color deal. Just do something that looks like a bluegill. <clears throat> um, any other baits that will work on this deal would be chatterbait yeah match the same colors get you a green and orange chatterbait if you can find that or just a, get a green pumpkin chatterbait and use that green and orange trailer swim bait trailer that would work I know they make a green and orange live magic shaft from Lake Fork Tackle that's my favorite chatterbait trailer um, and somebody asked me the other day in a message what my preferred size was so hopefully he sees this video because I did not answer him in that message because I get a lot of them on a lot of different platforms but uh I, on the live magic shed for the chatterbait trailer most of the year i use the small one the three and a half in the winter time i use the four and a half to get a little more bulk and a little more water movement when a little more water displacement when the water seems to be a little bit dirtier in the winter time um, so most of the year though i'm actually using the small one and when i do i trim the skirt on my chatterbaits to the first notch in the live magic shed because i don't want that skirt extending past any of those notches affecting that tail action because it's a very subtle quiver behind that chatterbait with that live magic shad. Uh, some days a frog will work on this pattern. Some days. Get you old, I mean a frog looking frog, a green one, brown one. Old red, that old red frog, Strike King has that old red one that is popular on the tour. Uh, that's a good color for a brim spawn. Because uh, it's really brown. It's not red. Uh, but here you know that's not always going to be the case because a lot of times those fish are going to be sitting those brim are spawning on the bottom those bass are going to be down near the bottom on whatever cover they're holding on waiting on a brim to swim off near the bottom so if you're fishing in you know if the brim bed is in say four five six foot of water deep maybe even three foot of water or deeper then that frog's not really your best option that bass is looking this way for those brim he ain't really focused on what's up here so much because he's waiting um, now if they're in shallow water if they're in one foot two foot of water now that frog is you know if you got a six or seven or eight pounder sitting right here he's at least from here to here off the bottom now that frog's really like it ain't nothing but a head lift and a suction and he's got it so in that situation the frog can be very effective when the brim are spawning shallow but if they're spawning in three or four foot water or deeper I don't usually mess with anything top water around a brim bed so yeah so that's kind of how I do the bait selection. And as you can see, it doesn't, like, I don't care which bait I'm throwing on them. It's just about give me something that looks like a brim and what can I fish effectively. If it's a calm area, back in a pocket, back in the back of a creek somewhere and it's calm, man, we're going to pitch and flip every piece of cover around there. Good thing about the pitching and flipping is whether it's wood or grass edge or whatever, you can do it, right? If it's a wind blowing area more closer to the main lake or I just got some wind funneling back into that pocket, then I'm going to pick up a square bill if I can get away with it. Or I'm going to pick up a swim jig or a chatterbait or maybe a frog in the right situation. So it's just about what you can fish effectively. And I would say that that probably, that principle, right, that principle as far as bait selection, if you ask the guys that do it for a living, that tournament fish for a living and are the best in the world about bait selection, I think that 99% of them would tell you that it is more about what they can fish effectively in an area as far as the type of bait they're throwing. It has a lot less to do with, well, this color is great or this type of bait is great or, you know, it doesn't matter. You've got to be able to present a bait effectively for a high, the highest percentage of the day that you can spend putting a bait in a fish's face, the better off you are. That's just the way bass fishing works. Because we all know, like, they'll bite a lot of different stuff, right? That's what makes the sport interesting in a lot of ways is that these things eat plastic and metal every day or we wouldn't be here. They're not smart. So you can use a plethora of different baits. So use the ones that you can keep in their face the most based on the situation you got in front of you. Be it brush, docks, timber, grass, whatever. You know, if they're in shade under docks, you gotta have something you can skip. You gotta have something you can consistently get back to them. Now it may be a Cinco on a spinner rod and it may be a jig on a bait caster and it may be a frog that you can skip, whatever it is. But you gotta have something you can get to them efficiently if they're under dock back in the deep shade, right? Just no different than when we pick crankbaits based on different depths, based on where the fish are at. 
you got to have something you can effectively put in their face for the highest percentage of the day possible. Y'all better come up with some questions now because I'm about out of talking points. <laughs> I'm just making stuff up now. <laughs> yeah, you're right, though. I, I look forward to this brim thing every year ever since you kind of turned me on to it a couple years ago. And yep. now I'm really focused on it. And I know where they, I, I know the whole creek and I know yeah. where they set up. And yep. they don't hardly ever change a whole lot, it seems like, that brim beds. They tend to like certain areas, yeah. and so you can tell them, but they're just now, seems to be just now. Yep, we're right on the cusp of it. Last week, yep. they're, they're, I haven't seen any of the beds, but the bass have um, switched from swim baits, you know, four and a half inch swim baits. They won't even touch it all of a sudden, and now my buddy just caught one on a ghillie last night. Yep. And he goes, I can't believe it. And I go, yeah, that's it. They're, they're switching. Yeah, we're, we're at the tail. We're at the very end of the bass spawn. There is still a few bass spawning. Uh, we're at the very tail end of the bass spawn, and every year that coincides with when the brim spawn starts. And it's very consistent and so underutilized. Can't emphasize that enough. And here's the good thing about Lake Fork this year for this pattern. I've probably seen more brim on the bank. You know, like while I've been sight fishing for bass over the last couple of months, I've probably seen more brim on the bank running around these bass net beds uh, than I've seen in, you know, maybe ever, like in a lot of years. Like there's been a lot of brim up on the bank this year, which means there's going to be a lot of brim spawn, a lot of areas that hold a good brim spawn bite. Um, yes. I'm seeing a ton of them. Yeah. Back oh, there. back by your place? Yeah, I finally yeah. caught my first under today, you know, his first uh, under the slot fish today. Everything has been above slot for oh, the yeah. last two months. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. I mean, they've yeah. all been above slot. We've got a lot of slot fish in the lake right now. Uh, and I mean, a lot few. of three and a half, four pound fish to seven pound fish. Man, we have got a bunch of them in the yeah. lake right now. Yeah. I don't know anybody complains about catching those. If you do, don't hire me. <laughs> if, if catching three and a half to seven pound fish disappoints you, do not hire me. Because I love it. And I will do it every day if I can, if I know how. Um, it's it awesome, is, man. It's it awesome. is strange, though. It's, it's hard. I, I couldn't believe when I caught that one today. It was 15 and a half. I, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> now, I've got one spot. I will say I got one spot that I was earlier, earlier in the year sight fishing in there, and I hadn't been in there in a while. And just kind of on a whim, I was chasing a shad spawn a week or so ago and uh, had a little bit of a shad spawn going out on a point at the mouth of this pocket. And uh, some birds there went up there and caught one or two, and that was it. But then I just said, you know what, we're here. Let's just run the back of this pocket and throw some topwaters and, and some other stuff. You know, little, my little spinning blade Cinco that I've been throwing, right? And uh, went back there and caught a bunch of fish. And every one we caught, tournament under. I've got a heck of a tournament hole. And I don't ever look for that, but, like, I've gone back two or three other times. I can't catch a slot fish in there, dude. Like, it's all unders. So, for those of you that like tournament fishing... <laughs> you might want to go subscribe to the Fish Life app because I'm about to do an update, and I waited for the May update because I knew, I knew we still had at the end of April, beginning of May, that first few days, we still had a whole bunch of spawning bass, and it was still the same pattern it had been for all of April, and I knew it was about to change, so I didn't want to do an update the first few days of May, right around the first, and then a week or two later, it's all about to flip. So I've waited till it started flipping, and now I'm about to do an update. So if you got, if you want to fish the Legends tournament, or if you want to fish Bass Champs. You probably want to go check out the Fish Life app premium package because there's going to be a pocket on there that is absolute money in the bank. Like, I never would say that I'm good at fishing the slot tournaments out here. I hated doing it before I was guiding. I didn't do much of it because I didn't like it. I didn't like catching four and five pounders and getting beat by seven pound bags. It bothered me. Um, but I've got a, I've got a hole right now. If I could sign up for that Legends tournament, I'd be putting my money down, dude, because I could win some money. Yeah, yeah, that's. That's amazing. Yeah. But that's, you know, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Most of the I lake has been like what you're talking about. This is like a one little pocket isolated deal where it's just straight <laughs> unders, man. How about that? They're all ganged up. Mm hmm. Frost it's has been stupid good this week. Stupid. Oh, really? Yeah. Stupid. All of a sudden. All of a sudden, it's just crazy. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good to hear. I've kind of missed that, and I'm going to tell you why. So, for me, the frog bite, 
I was anticipating this being such a great frog year because of all the flooded cover. And I threw a frog a lot in March and a little bit in April. And it was like, you would get fish to blow up on it, but they would miss it. They just wouldn't get it. So I started throwing a yellow magic. They would blow up on that. They have a harder time missing that. And we've caught a lot of good fish on it. <laughs> Got them triple hooks hanging off the bottom. That's right. So uh, they had a hard time licking that one. It would, it would bite them back, you know, and uh, they'd just come here and lick that frog. Six so, chances and opportunities. So I'll put that frog away and just been throwing yellow magic. It's been going for weeks now where I've been catching my yellow magic. But this week, the, the funny thing is you say the frog bite, this week the, the yellow magic bite has faded away to almost non-existent now. And we've been having to resort to other ways, you know, we've been throwing that bladed Cinco and all that stuff. Um, and catch the fish that way, but but the topwater bite has slowly faded away to where, you know, I think we had two swirl on it and miss it, and only caught one on it this morning on the on the yellow magic deal. So almost non-existent on that, and it's faded throughout the week. And I know there's a change going on, and I know from here going forward, I'm gonna be on that brim spawn deal hard and heavy. But it's good to hear the situation the lake's in right now. If you can pick up a frog and go and catch them, dude, you can do some damage. So thank you for the heads up. Because yeah. I will be doing that first thing. And that Whiskey Myers guy, that frog he made. Good frog. That is a, I, I basically just give the rest of my frog away. Yeah, so that Toad is. Thumper Lure. So Cody Cannon is the lead singer of Whiskey Myers. He's a huge fishing fan, huge fisherman. He's a good fisherman. I've been in a boat with him a few times. Um, he's started his own bait company called Toad Thumper Lures. And he designed a frog and... Uh, not only is Cody good at fishing, he's got access to a lot of guys that are like some of the best in the world that will give him, because of who he is, being a rock and roll superstar, like they'll give him their input, their their ideas. Their, they, they'll give him the juice for free just because he is who he is. So he gets a lot of great information and input from a lot of really accomplished anglers uh, at the highest levels. And, uh, yeah, he's designed a frog that is – yeah. From everything that I, I have not thrown it yet, but from everything that I have heard, it is supposed to be pretty special. I'm getting about a 75 percent hookup. Okay, yeah, that's, well, you know that's hold on just a second. That's hold about on. unbelievable. Yeah, they yeah. they hold on to it. I don't know why, but it it it, uh, it comes through the water so nice, and it is a sweet frog. He really did his research on that frog. I was kind of skeptical buying it, but. Uh, I went ahead and bought it because I read the article in the, that he had written in the, there was a magazine and I said, well, I'm going to try one. And believe it or not, it, it's, it doesn't have the sharp lines on it, like you said, and I think that really helps with the, hmm. the hook set. When you pull it, they don't miss it. The rest of them all, all have right. those lines. I need Frog's text has been sent to Cody Cannon. <laughs> I literally just texted him. I need frogs ASAP. <laughs> they're that good. They're, believe me, they're good. Well, it's funny. You don't even have to bend the hook. Hmm. Huh? They come out like they're supposed to. Uh, no, it is. It's. Oh, look, it's I'm just the body's you, designed right. I it, got you. It's something okay. to do with the smooth lines on it. They just don't. They they don't miss it. That's always the test for me on a frog, right? Like you take a frog, and I, you know, like on a spro or, or a six inch frog, any any of my frogs I've used over the years. I like to take the hooks and, and, you know, if the hook's bent like this, I never want to bend them up. You don't want to start springing the hook and, and weaken your hook. That can cause a hook to actually break by doing that when you get a big fish on. Um, so I never like to bend my hooks up. I've heard some guys preach that over the years. Uh-uh, bad idea in my opinion. The body's right here. The hook lays here. I like to just spring them out a little. Just torque them out. Just, just twist it a little bit out, right? And just enough to where my test is take the frog and take my finger down it. If it doesn't catch my finger, i got to bend it out some more. But if it'll catch my finger, I'm good. So it sounds like with that frog, the way the body is designed, it may already catch the skin on your finger without even bending them out. I don't know, but it, it, it works. Either way, it hooks them. It, right? That, that mm. white one or that creamy colored one, it's yeah. just, they can't lay off of it. And they don't miss it. I've had them come back uh, for it. Well, I'm going to start my, my, my next guy trip. is going to start with two frogs tied on at your dock. Well, we're gonna start at your dock and go. You, I, I, <laughs> that's between us and this room. Here, then you're we got we got a coontail growing in there that's just bigger around. Yeah, that's the advantage of coming here live, folks. You get GPS coordinates for free. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Don't miss it next time. And I said, well, I'm going to go over and get that because it's flat calm. Now I'm, I'm on patrol motors on one. It's quiet, you know, and I've been catching some real nice fish back there. Yeah. So I ease over and I look down and I get real close. I mean, right here. And you know how clear the water is. Yeah. It's not a spinnerbait or chatterbait. It's a tail. The tail was this wide of the bullshit. And this much of it was sticking out of her mouth, and that's the white I was seeing. And she's looking. I did at me. see that. I did see that. Yeah. And I'm not kidding you. That shad had to be this big because yeah. this fish, you couldn't have put your hand would have been this close, but her back. Yeah. And well, I knew that was the day before the mega bass. Yeah. I said, well, you ain't gonna eat again for a few days, you know. Yeah. She couldn't even swallow it all. Yeah. But there. That was a giant. That's the biggest bass well, I've ever seen in birch. And there's some big gizzard shad that, for whatever reason, have always been in there. There's gizzard shad that have, like, lived their whole life in that pocket for the most part. And they're all, like, I see them. I've seen them over the years in there. And, the, 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 yeah, some of the gizzard shad in there are 14, 16 inches long. They're, like, good tournament undersized gizzard shad. But in the mega bass, that's the thing. The guys aren't throwing a big enough bait. If yeah. they're eating that back in a pot, yeah. in that way back? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think people underestimate, like, everybody, you talk about the big gizzard shell on Lake Fort, I think everybody thinks of the main lake. No, dude, like, I got several creeks on this lake where way back in them, you'll find the biggest shad I ever saw, like, floating on the surface anything, was as far back in a creek as you could go, and it was 18 inches long. Now, we're worried about a seven or eight inch swim bait being too big. There's 18, and that 18 inch shad was knocked out because something tried to eat it. Because it wasn't dead. It was just knocked through. It was stunned. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah, right, exactly right there. Uh, like a week later after I saw that shit, I caught a 10-6. Yep. So, like, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. That, They're in there. That's and they what, eat big baits. No, that's your bait is never, there's nothing worth throwing. There's not a bass fishing rod made that can throw a swim bait that's too big for a bass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, to make a swim bait too big for a bass, it'd have to weigh, like, four. 12, 14 ounces, right? There's not a bass swim bait rod. There's not a bass rod made to throw that. So there, there's nothing you're going to get your hands on in, in the bass fishing world that's too big for a bass to eat. Doesn't exist. <laughs> friend of mine, guy, not on this lake. <clears throat> a guy, yeah. friend of mine, had a young 12-year-old girl. She caught a two-pound crappie. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then a 12-pound bass. Ate the crappie? Ate the crappie. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this, this crappie fishing around here, I'll tell you, that story all the time. Yeah. 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 Uh, my buddy lives in Penson. Yesterday, he said his neighbors came back in. They were catching big overs. And I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, they went out crappie fishing with a guide. And they, they saw a big fish down there. And they caught some brim. And they put the brim down there. And everything they were pulling up was giants. Oh, yeah. They were all eating the brim. Hmm. And I said, well, that's cheating. I don't do che I don't cheat. I mean, that's not but, illegal. No, I know. But what they were probably doing is illegal. They were probably actually just dropping crappie down there. And that is illegal. Because <laughs> they were catching crappie right there, those bass were eating crappie. Yeah. I promise you. Right. But so that's 20-something feet of water, you figure, because that's where all the crappie are right mm -hmm. now. So we, uh, we do have them. Not all the crappie. We caught one on a wacky worm this morning in like a foot of water in the back of a pocket, a crappie. <laughs> I said, what is he doing back here? Y'all supposed to be back out on the main lake? That dude's lost, man. He's lost, yeah. He's a lost. Man. And he's been a wacky worm. So that crappie, you know what? It's 2023. He can identify as a bass. I was going to say he was transitioning. He can identify as a bass if he wants to. <laughs> he was you know, transitioning into a bass and he was trying to eat like a bass. Yeah, that's it. Ate a dang wacky worm. I'm not very secretive about things, but so when something is that special, and I know there hasn't been hardly a lot of people going up there. There hasn't been. Especially not the people that are like the guides. There's no guides going up there. I know that. If there is, there might be one or two, but I doubt it. Very seriously, there's been any guides going up there. Because you hear the rumblings when you're guiding, right? Like, you hear the rumblings of, well, this area's good or that area's good. We can catch them over here. We can catch them on this pattern. Ain't nobody talking about anything like that. And that, by the way, is like my deal. Like, that situation. I, I told you I'd show you the trail. Yeah, that's, yes, I need that. I did that situation is my deal. You know, that. That deal right there, backwater, clean, all that good stuff, like vegetation, like that's that's my yep. if any situation is one that I prefer over others, it's that one. It's a good thing the lake going down. It's, it was 
You know, I, and I've been, well, you know, last year I became so offshore because you had to. There wasn't anything else, and the bite was so good offshore that I'll be honest. With you, in my head, looking forward to summer, I've been like, man, there's not going to be those fish going to be more spread out. A lot of them are going to stay shallow. There's so much stuff up there for them. Like, how is the summer going? Like, I've been, ha- I've had some concerns on how the summer bite's going to be. But you find you two or three areas like that, it'll hold up through the summer. And you'll catch their butts, and people won't really be back in there and won't know how to get back in there. And, you know, you got to have a little Keith Poche in you to go back in some of them areas. Right? Or y'all heard that mess. Or you spend, spend $100 and you yeah. buy your, your software, and then you can yeah. get into places. I don't faster. think he'll put that one on. <laughs> not, no, that one's too, like, where he's talking about, that's yeah, right there. There ain't no real trail. Like, not, not no. one you can. No. Not one you can like sell to people and let them try to run it because that ain't gonna work out. <laughs> like those aren't those aren't the ones you can just look at a line and go. Like there's a difference between trails that you can look at a line and run, and trails that you got to know. Like I got a zig and zag right here. You know, like there's some of that. So. Yeah, I run one side of the poles for a while, and then I run the other side. Yeah, but I did that on purpose. It's a pretty straight shot, fairly, but it's the uh, I didn't want to keep it to where I'd run one side of the poles and people would follow me. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Nice. That's using that lump three feet above your rear end right there. That's good. Yeah. You got to remember, they, they, they tend to try to follow me. Yeah. Especially the guys with power poles and three people on the boat. <laughs> also known as fishing guides <laughs> I'm very astute to those people yeah well you know I think one thing that I can say for myself well, I'm, we're sitting here talking him and hauling around but I don't think I don't think there's any one time when you could say that I've come in there and hole jumped you in any kind of way no, no. I don't and you're welcome to it and we'll, we'll talk about it and I, and I, but you know I mean you know I fish back in there I yeah. fish back in, Bur- in, in some of that area but uh you know, it's never anything where I've done that. Like, there are guys, though, that, I mean, there's dudes that are starving for information out here. And they're, you know, they're hunting down. And I'm going to tell you, you know how you know who they are? The dudes that are blocking the backgrounds in their pictures? They're the ones looking at the backgrounds and all of your pictures and watching where everybody fishes and all that stuff. They think everybody does that because they do it, so they put blur the backgrounds in their pictures. That's the worst ones is the ones that blur the backgrounds. Yeah, guaranteed. Because yeah. I know some of them, and I've had conversations, and they, every day, they discuss who's fishing where. I watch a lot of videos on YouTube, and it's kind of funny if you've been on the lake for a while, you can... Oh, you can pick it up. You can notice... I'm not real good yeah. at that. I'm not as good as some people are, but some of these guys out here, like they're like, oh, I know that leaf on that tree. I'm like, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, come on. There's plenty of fish in this lake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's the funny part about it is... is well, and this lake is fished so good this year, this spring. Dude, you could... This spawn, you could go anywhere. anywhere. Yeah. I mean, you can go anywhere and find bed fish. Now, there's some areas that have more, some areas that have bigger, whatever. But, man, you could go anywhere and have a great day on this lake this spring so far for the most part. Very few exceptions to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's been a lot of people that come out here and struggled. I think they just get overwhelmed by how much good stuff there is to fish. And they don't get in the right types of areas. But if you're in the right type of area, you can catch them all spring long this yeah. spring so far. So far, you have they're trying to work creatures through that junk. Yeah, a lot of people are just trying to flip, and, you know, you got to sight fish for them. Or, you know, a lot of people are still running those shallow points, and that deal, it, here lately there's a little bit more of that happening, but it, it just hasn't been what it's been in the past. And that's what had me worried about the summer is the main lake structure stuff is like, we're already not seeing fish on main lake structure because the main lake structure fish normally start in March, April, and May on the shallow points. And then... As it gets hotter, you just get deeper type deal. And then later in the summer, you go to different types of structures other than points. And that's kind of the traditional thing around here. There's not been a lot of them on those shallow points. So how many are going to show up on those deeper points in the next few weeks? I don't know. Like, it's not going to be as many as last year. Last year, they had nothing else to go to but structure. This year, the whole lake is lined with cover for them. So there's going to be some that are going to live in that junk all year long. Yeah. They're mm-hmm. never going to leave. I think the game completely different this year. The whole the field changed, the rules changed, everything changed, and the fish are not acting the same as they were twelve. And months how ago. bad are most fishermen about? Well, I caught them here last year at this time, 
So I'm going to go do that. Biggest freezing wild. And I'll here. tell you who the worst ones are about that fishing guides. It's dude. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do to fish like every single day, year after year, and have an area that is produced for two or three years in May for you, and then leave it alone because they weren't there for a couple of days the first couple of times you went. Like even if they're not there for a couple of weeks, you still keep. All right, they're going to be here at some point. Like it's the hardest thing in the world to not go back and fish those areas that you know have produced great fish for you. Um, but sometimes you need to, and I think this is a year. I think you're right. Lake, completely different lake this year with the situation it's in. And uh, it's going to be important to have an open mind and fish what's presented to you right now. Yeah, I mean, it's technically it's 25% bigger lake than it was 12 months ago. That's, that's, I'm no math major, but that sounds right. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, there's more acreage, yeah. of water, things that were yeah. not in the water at all last year are in under six feet of water, eight feet of water this year, you know? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, and there's so much stuff in the water to fish. You're going to have to hunt to find some of those special areas, like what he was talking about. There's there's going to be plenty of those type of areas on the lake, but you're going to have to go seek them out. And mm -hmm. it's a time investment getting back into those areas on this lake, and you're going to spend time getting into those areas, and you're going to fail in some of them, in a lot of them. But you do it enough times, you're going to find you a handful of them that are special, and they're going to get you through the year. Because the thing about those type of areas is once those fish set up in there after the spawn. They're there until something changes in the water column, until the water drops, the water rises, the clarity gets blown out. Like something drastic has to happen to move those fish, and that does not usually happen on this lake hardly ever. I mean, this lake just doesn't really get blown out muddy very often. It doesn't, the water level doesn't jump a couple, two or three feet in a day or two. Like we just don't have that stuff here. It's just a very stable fishery, which is, I think, is one of the biggest reasons it's the longevity of how good it's been is because of how stable it is. It's yep. essentially, there's no river. It's essentially a really giant cow pond. You know, yeah. essentially right. that's what it is. And, and you think about fishing a pond and how stable it is and how consistent it is. We got a really big version of that here. You know, you know how you'd always talk about how they go to the, what I'd always see and always waited for this time of year but after you had, you kind of taught me the, the choke points. Yeah. You know, when I learned that certain places were choke points, and I would, man, when, when they, this is when they would always go to the choke point. Yeah. Not, I have, I'm checking every day and nothing. And they're staying in the cover, and, and you're just going to have to go after them and, you know, go along the bank. And you get one about every 100 yards, and it's just it's well, very most, different. Most animals in existence, in, including human beings, most human beings, if you could find you a spot that you really like, let's say your living room recliner, right? If somebody bring you food, bring you water. <laughs> most people wouldn't move much from there very often. <laughs> like, so if that fish can leave that spawning bed and set up on these three bushes and Brim and Shag keep swimming by, he's not leaving <laughs> ever, ever, ever. That's where, yeah. we're, that's where we are. Yeah, no well, doubt. That's, that's, I that definitely day. feel like that's where the lake is. That's where I'm I feel like fish have finished spawning, and they go from that bed to that bush, and they got food, and they got no reason to leave. You know? They got now, plenty. Maybe if the water temps get hot enough, some of them will move, um, but I don't think there's any chance that a high percentage or a majority of the fish ever leave the shallow water this year. I think it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a shallow water grind, you know, pitching, flipping, swim, jigging, all that kind of stuff is going to be a thing the whole year. I really do. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna wear them out on that six inch whale with a understand. Oh, that little whale's a good swim back. I got so tired of fighting, you know the, you know, because the holes weren't defined. Yeah. And you needed something you could fish through it. And so I just started throwing that six inch whale, and I'm not kidding. I'll just yeah. wear them out. I'll tell you another one that, especially as the water temps get hot, that you need to just. Keep it in your back pocket, and it's kind of like they're starting to bite it right now. I've been catching some on it this week, caught some on it today. Is that little hollow belly? The warmer that water gets, that faster, tighter wiggle that hollow belly is going to catch them better than anything else. I did try it'll, switching to that last yeah. week. Yeah. It, it, last week, it's just started to get yeah. warm enough where they're biting that one real good. That bait's going to be a bait that you got to have in your boat because there ain't no other hollow belly that wiggles like that. There's no other swim bait on the market that wiggles that fast and tight like it does. And as the water temps heat up and their metabolism, everything speeds up in the water column, movement-wise, man, that hollow belly is about the best bait you can throw. And it's that smash that hollow belly. It's a one-of-a-kind. 
It's a different bait. I went and bought them out over. <laughs> I know better. I know, you know how it's this all work. Yeah, you know? and they were out here. Yep. And so I went and bought them out. I didn't know Lake Fork Resort had them. I was all down and depressed. And I went and they're on the back wall. He's got a selection of. Uh, yeah. On the, I guess it'd be the, it'd be the north wall. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And uh, I think there might. He goes. That's a. You get the last one. I said, oh, there might be one package left. Yeah. You know, but no. After you turned me on to that, I, that bait's special. I'm a total believer. That bait's yeah. real special, real special. No, I don't you know, know what it is. It's, it's well, it's 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 cool. just a different wiggle. You know, he put the extra plastic in the head, and you wouldn't think something that small would make that big of a difference. Like all he did was make the plastic denser in the head and put more farther back into the head. Whereas most hollow bodies, it's just you poke right through and you're in hollow stuff, you know. But his hollow body has a solid head for about that far. And it adds just enough weight to the front of the bait that the head does this when you're reeling it. And the tail kicks real fast like all hollow bellies do, but the head goes, and with the whole body trimmers. It's like a weedless chatterbait almost, you know. And the whole thing, like you can actually feel, if you got a good sense of it, you got one of my rods, like you'll feel the vibration from that bait when you're reeling it in. And uh, it just goes through all the cover real good, and they, they flat out eat it. Flat out eat it. I remember I told you uh, I threw like three different hollow bodies. They were spawning on that, on Briar Point right there. Yeah, and yeah. They wouldn't touch it. And he had, I told him and he gave me a, one of the smash tech ones. He said, try this. The next day I went out there and you know, it was every morning they just, it's like clockwork at, at certain times of the year. We're coming mm -hmm. into that. First calf, bam. Second calf, bam. Third yeah. calf, It's bam. a different wiggle, it triggers them. Yep. You know, the thing with those swim baits, all those swim baits, the fish will follow them. The difference is with that one, having so much erratic wiggle and so, such a fast, tight wiggle, they react and bite it. They love it. Yeah. 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 So if you kind of got a uh, hollow body, smash, smash tech. tech hollow body, if you can find it. <laughs> it's special. It's very it is special. Different. Little special. Holly. I may have one. I don't remember. They make a little holly, and they make a big one that I, I catch them on out here sometimes, too. I, 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 I do I have some that, big ones. There's a tackle yeah. store in Dallas that's a, been there forever, and I also bought the Smash Tech, the one that looks like a brim. I can't think of the name. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, and Hard bait or soft bait? Soft. So it's probably his line through bluegill or weedless well, bluegill. Well, it, it's he not makes the line bluegill. through. He's got, it's got the split in the bottom where the hook yep. comes through. Yeah, so that's the weedless bluegill. Okay, yeah. yeah, and I got one of those, and I've just been trying it in the last 10 right. days or so going. And so it sounds yep. like I may be yeah. I may be rigged up right. I may have just been premature. and so. Yeah, a little bit. It's just, so start, it's time, it's just it's starting time. to happen. It's yeah, it's I'm just getting more. going. This week, a lot's changed on this, on this lake this week. Yeah. A lot has changed on this lake. I've got one of those Andy's hollow body on the deck right now, and that, they're going to be there for a while. You know, just between me and you, right? Just between me and you. The camera's off. No, the camera's on. <laughs> but, so just between me and you, and all of you. That area you're talking about, where you saw a fish had that big gizzard shed stuff down her throat, right? So an area like that that holds a big gizzard shed, if you start seeing big gizzard shed in any of those areas like that, especially that one because it always – like year after year has them in there if the wind blows in there <clears throat> instead of throwing the little hollow belly get you a couple of them bigger ones and throw that bigger hollow belly because mm -hmm. wherever those big shed are they'll eat that big hollow belly on a weedless hook it's an eight-op weedless owner beast hook yeah, yeah. and I, you just i've never got them to bite that but now, oh, I, man. now I know there's a the reason they will you everybody remembers the 13 year old kid that caught the 12 pounder on my channel the uh, four or five years ago now maybe it's been a while uh, same exact situation as that pocket you're talking about it, it was a pocket at the mouth of glade and it had the flooded bushes the grass all that stuff and every morning during that stretch when he caught that 12 pounder for three weeks every single morning we would go in there and you could go in there and throw a wacky worm and you could throw a frog and you could catch fish and catch some good fish but if you would throw that big hollow belly you were going to get two to three bites. And every fish was over seven pounds for three weeks. So there was one. One fish in three weeks was under seven pounds. It was five and a half. <laughs> oh, darn. You'd get two to three bites every morning, and they'd all be, every one would be over seven pounds. And the biggest one was a 12 pounder that that kid caught. Damn. Yeah. So the deal was that morning, the story on that goes like this. We go in there, and there's some bed fish in there still a little bit. And we're throwing a whack. I got the kid throwing that whack around. He's catching some fish. And I tell his dad, 
Because he's a little kid. He's like a 12-year-old little baby-faced kid, you know. So I didn't want to hand him an eight-foot rod and a big swim bait. But I told his dad at the back of the boat, his dad's a big old guy, I said, hey, if you'll throw that big bait, you may not get very many bites. You're probably going to get two bites exactly. I go, but they're going to be really big. So <laughs> he's, he's throwing that big swim bait back behind us, you know, out in the middle, kind of. And uh, he gets a bite and sets the hook. It didn't get a good hook set in the fish for whatever reason. And uh, the fish jumps halfway to the boat and throws the bait. But we saw the old fish is like an eight or nine pounder. And they're all like free. But they're like, the kid's biggest fish he ever caught is like three or four pounds. The dad's biggest fish he ever caught is like five or six pounds. They're like, holy crap. That's the biggest thing we've ever seen. And they're kind of freaking out. And the kid goes, can I throw one of those? I'm like, and I've seen him cast now. Like, this ain't your average 12 year old. Like, this kid can fish. So I'm like, yeah, man, you can fish. So I tie him a second one on. He starts throwing it about five, ten minutes later. He just sitting there and he's like, I mean, he said it the wrong way, too. He, he fires that swim bait back there and he's reeling like this. And he goes, he goes, he goes oh, got him. And I'm like, oh, God, that's on the big, like in my head, immediately go, oh, crap, that's on the big bait. He's about to get his butt kicked because he's offhand. Like, I'm going to turn around and he's on his offhand side. I'm like, there ain't no way, dude. And the kid does this. He goes, he goes oh, Oh, got him. Lifts his line over the power poles and calmly walks to the back of the boat and just starts fighting the fish. I'm what like, a kid. <laughs> Damn, kid. Kid's a stud. Yeah. And he fought that fish. And I mean, I couldn't have done it any better. I don't know anybody could have done it any better. And he fought that fish. And, I mean, she come up water a couple times and he put her down and she went this way and he turned her that way. And I was like, my man. He's going to be on go. tour. He's my man. On tour someday. So we get this fish in the boat and it's so massive. It's 12 pounds. And he's just like, he don't say nothing. He just, he just looks at the fish and looks at me and looks at his daddy. <laughs> <laughs> and his dad's kind of hollering. And, and I'm kind of like, like as he's really fishing, I'm like, that's it. Like first time I jump, I'm like, that's a 10 pounder for sure. And then it jumps a little closer. I'm like, that's bigger than 10 pounds. <laughs> we get in the net and I'm just like, holy crap. And I'm laughing and slapping hands with the dad. And trying to get him to slap hands. He won't give me a five. You know, he's just in shock, you know. So we take the pictures, and his dad hugs and tells him he loves him or whatever. Frogs are going to get sent to me when he gets home. That may be a month from now, so I may have to order some. Because <laughs> he may be on tour somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I may have to order some. Um, but anyways, you know, dad hugs and tells him he loves him or whatever. And then the kid goes and sits in the passenger seat of the boat for like hours. Doesn't move. He's, just <laughs> He's in shock. He's just literally in shock. And finally, like halfway through the day, he gets up and starts fishing a little bit again. Oh, yeah. that's priceless. Yeah. That's priceless. Yeah. And yeah. now, you know what the funny thing is? He's, he's, is he's grown up. He's 17 or 18 years old. Well, 16 or 17 years old. Because I think, I'm pretty sure it was in 2018, and he was 12, so he's probably 17. But he's gotten into high school baseball. He's a real good baseball player. He really doesn't even fish. As good as he was at a young age... And he went on after that for a little while and kind of stayed fish crazy. But you got a 12-year-old, 13-year-old that just caught a 12-pounder. And now he's going around catching four and five-pounders. And he's like, yeah, yeah. you the know, gone. it run him. It run him. Catching a fish that big that early, run him. I hope he gets it back. And uh, he probably will when he's grown up and he gets done chasing ball fields or whatever else he decides to chase, you know. Uh, but he's a great kid. Great kid. Great dad. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. probably my favorite guy trip moment. Probably will be my forever for the rest of my career. My favorite guy trip moment. It was just. That's a good one. It was really cool to have a kid that young. Kid, you know that fish was ounces from the junior state record. Dad gone. And we didn't even take an official weight on. We didn't have an, any idea. That fish weighed. I want to say it weighed twelve two or twelve three, and the official junior state record is like twelve thirty something on a hundred scale. So it's like so it'd be like it'd be like twelve pounds four or five ounces is the is the junior state record, and uh, that wow. fish was like just an ounce, a couple ounces away. Wow. And we didn't even know, like we didn't even think about that at all. So it wouldn't have counted even if it was, if it was 13 and a half, it wouldn't have mattered because we just, you know, those fish were in there, some of them were still spawning, and we just got good pictures, measurements, video, and released it because we wanted to let it go back and do its thing. But yeah, yeah, that so so to have a kid that young catch a fish that big is obviously, it, it's probably this. I'm, it is the second biggest fish that I know of on any kind of a record whatsoever that any you know junior has ever caught in the state of Texas. So that's a that's a 
That's good. That's going to be a hard one to beat, dude. Even if like a grown man catches a 14 or 15 pounder with me, I don't know that it's going to no, be better than that. Nothing beats a 12 year old. And, and we're sitting there filming it all. And, and, you know, the best part is his dad hugs him with just. It was a life moment. A hug that only a dad can understand the meaning of. <laughs> and kisses him on top of his hat and tells him he loves him, you know, and it's yeah. like. Yeah, they'll never forget it. His dad just watched him make a hole in one. I mean, if they were golfing, yep. it's the same. Yep. At Augusta. Yeah, it's the same. Call yeah. them million dollar moments. I yeah. got five kids. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Man. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't million like to admit to tearing up about much, but when money, I when money, I edit, money's no object at some point. Yeah. Million dollar moments. I don't like to admit to crying about much, but when I edited that video, it was I was choking back tears when that was going on. So it was it was special for my son.